Hi there. Welcome to Draw With Me. I'm Danny Gregory. It's Thursday. It's time to draw. I hope that you have drawing implements and the will to draw, and I will give you the reason to draw or the thing to draw. The reason to draw, there's lots of reasons to draw, but I think that today we'll figure out a few more. Why not? So we just went through our Earth Day maps. Pretty amazing. So many different interpretations of the, of the world around us, which is an apt metaphor for how drawing works. We look at something, we pick up a pen, we take out a sketchbook, we draw in it, and yet it's always different. It's different from day to day. It's different from person to person. Why is that? Is it because we are no good at drawing? No, of course not. It's because we're artists and we are internalizing the world outside and transforming it and turning it into art. So that's what we do. That is what our job is or our vocation or our, or our, uh, our hobby or whatever you want to call it. Anyway, um, I wanted to make a few minor announcements. Somebody has already brought up the uh, my bet noir, which is any word on the Q and art recording. So last week we did a fantastic Q and art um, about plein air, plein air watercolor, uh, urban sketching. It was really awesome. Our platform, and when I say our, I mean the platform that we pay somebody else to use to host webinars, screwed up. They seem to screw up in different ways at different times. But this is a new version of screwing up where they didn't record the session. Believe me, I'm far more <laughs> pissed about it than you are. Anyway, we are going to make it up to you. Because people came back and they said, well, hold on a second. You told me to sign up and that I could come and watch it anytime. And then where is it? I understand. Don't get me started. What we're going to do, I believe this is next week, David and Jimmy and I are going to get together and we're going to recreate the event. We're going to take all the questions that were posted and we're going to answer them again and we're going to record them properly this time. I will be in charge of recording them and then we will share them with you. So please be patient. We just needed to get everybody back in the same room. I had to bow, scrape, make lots of apologies to them for asking them to spend even more time doing this for us, but I promise you it will all work out. There was a lot of interesting stuff in there, and I think redoing it will actually sharpen um, our answers and could be even better. So stand by. We will let you know. We'll send you a new email with uh, um, information about it. I might even put it here on YouTube or on Facebook. So, um, I don't know yet, but I will let you know. And I will let you know here, and I will let you know in your email. Believe me, this is this is important stuff because we cover a lot of really interesting ground, and I don't want it to be lost. And, I, and if you missed it, I want you to be able to see it. And if you saw it and want to see it again, I want you to be able to do that. So I have to tell you, it's the biggest frustration. <laughs> That we have here is technology man it gets is it amazes it does so many amazing things for us it connects us it allows us to do what i'm doing now and yet it confounds us now maybe if we were a giant company and we had you know all kinds of technologists and you know av guys and all that kind of stuff this kind of thing would happen less than it does but in the end it's basically me playing the kazoo, the banjo with a tambourine tied to my ankle while I'm making up a song for you. That's kind of the way so much of this works. So anyway. Let's move on to funner things. One of, one of which is going to be Rethink Your Ink. So Derek Bacon is new. He's a new artist to sketchbook school. 
He's not new to the world, and he's certainly not new to the art world because he's been doing phenomenal illustration for a really long time. I know that you've been dawdling on this one because you're saying I don't fully understand it. And so I need you to take the leap of faith. Go and go to the website and look at it. Look at the page that we built in the video that we've made about Rethink Your Ink. And it will make you realize that you don't know a lot about ink. And ink is a super important medium, particularly for us sketchbook artists. Derek Bacon has, has created all kinds of phenomenal ways to use this medium that are fresh and new and exciting. And they make you realize that the humble pen can do all kinds of things you hadn't imagined. Trust me, it will be an exciting time. He's a very interesting artist with a, a, such a nice manner. He's English, so of course he's nice. Um, and he lives in Holland, which makes him not even nicer. So he's very nice. He's a good teacher. He's a great artist. You're going to learn a lot. And I also want to, want to remind you that if you're a Spark Breakthrough member, or Danny Circle, or any of the various iterations of um, most Spark members, this is free. And it's certainly at least discounted for you, no matter who you are, if you're a member of Spark. But for the Breakthrough members, it's free. So why would you miss this? It's going to be phenomenal. Um, and if you're not a Spark member, if you've never taken a workshop before, if you think you know what there is to know about ink, sign up. You can go to uh, bit.ly slash rethinkdb, um, or you can go to sketchbookschool.com and just look at the workshops, and then you will be ready for it on May the 8th. Um, you have until 5 p.m. Pacific on May the 7th to sign up. There's also going to be a feedback session with Derek where you're going to get even more insight into the work that you've made as a response to his tutelage. So I would strongly recommend you to sign up for that. And we've made an arrangement with Blick. We've built a special little mini store uh, at Blick that contains all the materials. They're not a lot of materials. It's ink. You probably own a lot of them already, but just in case you can get all the stuff that you need, exactly the stuff that Derek has specified at Blick. And uh, you can just go to bit.ly slash rethink supplies. But again, you'll get that information once you sign up. Okay, um, so that is, that is what I want to talk to you about, Ray Workshops. Um, what else can I tell you today? So you know what I've been thinking about is forgery. There seem to be a lot of, I don't know, like think documentaries on Netflix these days about forgery, art forgers, art thefts, but art forgeries too. I've always been sort of interested in art forgery. Um, I don't know what it is about it. And I have a little bit of, uh, I don't know, there's, there's something about trying to put yourself into the, the shoes, the smock, the beret of a famous artist, a great artist, and trying to channel them and to make something that they would have made. You know, there are forgers who just take it, a painting and make an exact replica of it. But then, of course, there are ones who do it in the style of. And <clears throat> there's, there's one right now that I saw on Netflix, which is about a guy who's like a... There's a, like a whole kind of ring of these art forgers, and it was tied to a very famous gallery in Manhattan. And uh, they forge Rothko paintings and Pollock and various other people. And uh, the guy who did the actual forgeries was, I think he was a, a Chinese immigrant who um, had studied art in China, but now was like was actually really amazing at making these forgeries. Um, so anyway, so this whole world of um, forgeries, of fakes, uh, uh, is fascinating to me. Um, Orson Welles made a film called F is for Fake, which is kind of a slightly weird self-indulgent film, but but also interesting on the subject. So there's something about it, I think, as artists, we're interested in it. I think the world at large is interested in it. Sometimes it troubles me that people in general are as interested in forgeries and fakes as they are, because... I think there's a slight subtext to it, which is 
Uh, yeah, anybody could do that. Yeah, particularly when it comes to like Rothko or Pollock. This notion that like, yeah, yeah, it's not, there's nothing special about that. Um, but also I think it has to do with the whole world of, of art as an investable thing, you know? So you can't just look at a piece of art as itself. You have to look at a piece of art as a, as a, as a piece of property and that has value because of its scarcity and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know. I'm, as I said, I, I'm interested, I'm intrigued, but I'm ambivalent at the same time. So. So I've decided to become a forger. Why not? How hard could it be? I've seen the videos and you are going to join me and we're going to do a forgery. And then we're going to, I don't know, maybe we'll try and sell it on the larger art market. Are you with me? Are you with me? Are you going to um, indulge your, your bad side, your criminal side with me? Let's do it. Now, one of the things that brought this to mind was this, which is, hold on a second, this. Actually, let me show you from here. <laughs> okay, which is, here we go. You see, remember what I was saying about technology before? Welcome to it. Here we have it. So, all right, let me just show you this. This is the... No, this is not going to do. Hold on a second. Let me fix this. What the devil? Anyway. Um, yeah, so as, you, as I've mentioned to you last time, um, we now have a sponsor, a really exciting sponsor. It's cool to be sponsored by somebody who you, frankly, would use their stuff anyway. But in this case, it's kind of the double whammy of being able to, um, you know, get support for sketchbook school because we, um, are sponsored by Hanamula. A H A H N E M U with an umlaut H L E. There will be a test on this Hanamula. So Hanamula makes this sketchbook that is really a, a very tasty sketchbook. It's called the Cappuccino. And first of all, I like this cover a lot, but what I like about this paper is this paper. This is toned paper. It is, I wouldn't say, I mean, is it, I guess it is cappuccino. Yeah, it's cappuccino. I was going to say, is it, is it, a, is, from the outside, it looks like espresso, but it is kind of cappuccino colored. And so if you've never worked on toned paper, it's really nice because you can, um, well, first of all, you can use, whoops, the wrong thing. You can use white. Yeah. Um, so we're going to use this as part of our forgery kit. You don't need to have this paper on you right now. I doubt that you uh, right, have time to rush out to the store and buy it, but I have it and I'll show you how we're going to use it. So, um, what I, I thought it was good for forgery because it's kind of old looking, right? You know, we're going to create something that's old. And this is what we're going to create. This is the forgery we're going to do. We're going to make a Vermeer. How hard could that be? Are you with me? I'm going to take this Vermeer painting, which is called the Milkmaid, or what I call art before breakfast, right? She's making breakfast. Let's be honest. Um, so yes, there we have it. And we're going to knock this out. And what we're going to do is we're going to create the long lost preparatory drawing that Vermeer did in his sketchbook. You know, he did it, right? But the thing about Vermeer is Vermeer is mysterious. People aren't quite sure how he made his paintings exactly. And they say that when you do an x-ray of one of his paintings, there really isn't much like underpainting and underdrawing. It almost seems like he was just like, boom, just started painting it. And it, what you see is what he painted, that there wasn't kind of developmental stuff. So therefore, there must be a lost sketchbook. And that's what we're going to create, a page from the lost sketchbook. And then we're going to flood the market with all of these lost Vermeer sketch preparatory sketches 
done of this art before breakfast hand, milk made thing. And if you have a Hanumula Cappuccino book, all the better. And if you don't, whatever you have, maybe he worked on different things. I mean, it's quite possible that he bought paper from Hanumula. Because that's one of the things about being a forger, right? One of the first things you have to do is you have to get the materials that the artist might have used. You can't just go to Blick and buy, you know, the latest thing and just knock it out. No, you've got to say, because that's the first thing they look at is like, is this the paper that could have been used? Well, Hanamula started making paper in 1584. So definitely Vermeer could have been using Hanamula paper. There we go. All right, so get let's get to work. Let's get to work and let me see if I can get this work ready. Okay, so here we have it. Here's the picture. Now look, if I'm not uploading the uh, reference picture today because um, you can just Google it. Just Google if you want if you want to work on this, if, if the picture that I'm showing on the screen is big enough, then um, just, Google Vermeer Milkmaid. There's a gazillion of them. That's what I did. That's how I got this picture. So why spend millions at your local museum buying a work of art when you can just download it from Google? Well, you know why. All right, so let us get ready. Oh, I just discovered that I have a very nice little ribbon here too. All right. So... Are you ready? Are you are you organized? Do you have your stuff all in place? Because that's important. Okay. I've got mine. I'm taking my picture here and I'm putting it to the side. But you need to see it. So therefore, um, I'm going to see how I can give this to you. I want to just set this up so that you can see. Uh, yeah. How's this look? Pretty good. Big enough for you? It is. And um, here's me. Yeah, that's not me. Here's me. Okay, here I am. Here's your artwork. And we're going to get to work. You can see that I'm dithering a lot because I'm still mucking around with my friend the technology department. But we're done. Okay, um, if you'd rather just watch me do it, then we can do that too. And I will come back to here. But now for now, I think I just want you to, to be able to look at it. And maybe I can adjust this a little bit too, so that you can see even more of my page and you can see even less of me. Here we go, all right. Let's get to it. So, um, I'm going to make a square. Vermeer paintings are actually relatively small. If you've ever seen one in life, they're not that big. Right, let me just measure. Is this a square? Yeah, it's more or less a square. So, but again, this is this is his sketch. So we don't have to be super. You know, we can be. A little sketchy about it because we're sketch we're sketch sketchbookers. Um, all right, so I'm going to start up here and I'm going to start drawing this window, which seems to occupy roughly half of the of the field, the plane. Is that what it's, the word is of the picture? One of the many things that I like about Vermeer is, unlike a lot of artists, particularly of his time, he is a person who focuses really on everyday life. You know, he makes art of his life, stuff around him. And he, you know, he wasn't painting kings and sci scenes from the Bible and he wasn't painting um, wealthy burgers 
you know, who, who, you know, wanted to spend their money on their portraits of themselves. Like he was painting like everyday things. You know, look at some of his famous paintings. Uh, the letter, it's just a girl reading a letter by a, I think it's by a harpsichord or something like that. And, you know, you really get to see like, this is what life was like. He's really giving you a sense of that. Just recording everyday life. And it's so nice. I mean, it's, it's not really something that you see that much in the classical world. The world, I guess classical, is that really the right word? You know, you don't see Titian doing that kind of thing. You don't see, you know, Michelangelo making uh, sculptures of somebody flossing. You know, it's just, it's all much more important than that. But, but Vermeer was cool with his drawing this, basically a servant, I guess she was in the house, making, um, you know, making breakfast for the family, getting stuff ready. Something that we can relate to, you know, we can look at it and say, yeah, yeah. I, I do that. That's like she's doing the same kind of thing I do all the time. Which is an, an essential part of art, certainly. It is an essential that you make stuff that's completely relatable. But it's certainly a nice thing. It's a, it's a nice insight into, into the world and into life. And again, going back to what I was saying at the very beginning about the maps, this is an opportunity for us to see his world through his eyes and to, you know, to think about our own lives as a result of it. One of the things that art can give you is this, this opportunity to think about things you don't think about. Vermeer was not a terribly successful painter, I don't think. I mean, I know that he died with like, bang, he died broke, dead broke. He had lots of children and, uh, you know, he, I mean, I, I guess he made his living entirely from being a painter. I don't think that people like had side gigs in those days necessarily. Maybe they did, anyway. Um, but he, you know, maybe he would have been more wealthy, perhaps, if he had picked a different thing to make art about. I don't know. But I'm glad that this is what he did. I'm sure you've seen the movies about him. There have been several movies made. I don't know. Not madly in love with any of the um, kind of... Fictional, fictional versions. Girl with the pearl earring. Do you remember that? Yeah. So it was another example of movies about artists that are just a little melodramatic and kind of not really focusing on the thing that made them exceptional. But that is my constant gripe about these things. So... Jules is pointing out that she is seeing things in this painting that she never saw before. And that's one of the benefits of being a forger, right? Is we're really looking at this very intensely. So she noticed the tiles along the skirting board back here, right? And then there's this weird little box thing. It's like a box, but I think it's, if you look at it really carefully, it seems to be some kind of a game board. Almost like checkers, but not quite. Again, something I'd never really noticed before. So yeah, these little tiles down here, that's pretty cool. And then just great colors in here too. I mean, we're not doing anything in color right now, but uh, the quality of this blue and the beauty of this dusty red, and then the gold up here. 
Very nice. And then let's see what we can do with her expression. Sort of looking down. And I got to say, I like this paper a lot. I like this color for this paper. It's sort of like melted chocolate ice cream, which is really nice. But also just, it feels very solid, which a lot of times drawing paper doesn't feel to me. It can feel sort of like I'm worried that it's going to go through. But uh, in this case, oh, I'm also drawing with a, with a brown pen. It's a Winsor Newton 0.5. Uh, pen. It's non-fading, so that would be important because, uh, you know, we want to explain, like, well, how did this drawing survive all these years? Well, it was done with non-fading ink, so of course it's still around. You know, Vermeer was, was careful to, uh, you know, make sure that his work would last. So, there we have it. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, will people say, well, hold on, his drawing, this drawing is really excellent. I had no idea. Vermeer's not known for his drawings. Well, this makes me a little suspicious. It's true. So therefore, I don't want, I'm trying not to do too good of a job. You know, I could draw this absolutely flawlessly, but instead I'm going to, I'm just going to screw it up in a few places so that it seems like plausible, right? Because we don't want, we don't want the like the FBI showing up and saying, "Yeah, you would you did too good of a job there, Gregory." We knew right, the the jig is up. We knew that this was not the real thing. Yeah, okay, fair enough. You got me. I was expecting you. I said, but otherwise, you really had us fooled because you used that uh, that brown paper and the sepia ink and. We knew it was, it was, it was Hanamula, so, you know, it was totally uh, appropriate to the, the time. Here's another thing about Vermeer. Light. Man, this guy could draw light like nobody's business. Maybe that's one of the obsessions of these northern artists, Rembrandt and so forth, is they were obsessed with light, maybe because, you know, it was just kind of dark up there. They didn't have, wasn't sunny most of the time. So maybe that's why they got as into drawing light as they did. But so that's some, something we want to think about is how we're going to kind of uh, make sure that we can reproduce that, re reproduce that effect of. Um, you know, that's really what he was paying attention to. So I'm going to, I'm sort of starting to get into, into tonal stuff here, you know, trying to just do a bit of hatching to indicate that, you know, I'm thinking about the light too, because I'm Vermeer. Because that's what you would do if you were doing a preparatory drawing, you would you know, you're blocking out the basic composition, but then that composition also requires you to think about where are the lights and darks and, you know, what is that, how is that going to affect where your eye goes in the final painting? So even things like her expression, stuff like that, not so important. So, you know, I don't have to really worry too much about getting that spot on. Although I could, just so letting you know, I could make this so that you would think that that was actually a photograph of this woman. But no, I'm not going to, because again, I'm not doing hard time for this, folks. So I've got to make sure that there is some plausible deniability in here. You know, so that those, all those art historians who are going to be pouring over this at Sotheby's, we're going to say, yeah, oh yeah, no, that's totally, that is totally authentic. And what a miracle to find that, uh, that beautiful cappuccino sketchbook of Vermeer's that we never knew existed because we never knew that he did sketches. But of course, he was a great artist, so of course it would make sense that he would. Okay, so now having done all this, 
I'm now going to bring in a little bit of pencil action because I want to, I mean, here I get to add some white. So I'm going to make my whites really white so that my, the brown of the paper is going to function as the middle, mid ground, right? And so I'm looking like, what are the whitest parts, the lightest parts here, you know, um, and that will also, that will be my indication as to where I want to make stuff lighter, but it also helps to create volume. Of course, I mean, your eye goes right to that milk. And the milk is that white stream, but it has some dark around it. So that I think, you know, I think that was probably something that Vermeer thought about when he worked on his painting. When he first had this idea for the painting, he probably thought like, gosh, this kind of semi-dark room is, um, is really depressing. But when she pours that milk, it, it kind of almost glows. That's pretty cool. Like I want to make a painting of that. Quick, where's my sketchbook? Right? You know, that's what he said. But he probably said it in Dutch. The thing, other thing I was thinking about is I would like to annotate this a bit, you know, and just say, um, maybe write some notes that Vermeer wrote to himself about this, saying, uh, yeah, I want to uh, remember to go to the art supply store and pick up some more of those, uh, whatever it is. Whatever, what are the arts? Do they even have art supply stores there? Need to do a bit of research. Because if we say that they did and then they didn't, that would be a dead giveaway. So we might need to do a bit of research into that. But but then I was also thinking, well, I can also just use Google Translate. So I'll, I'll probably write this stuff out. Google Translate it into Dutch. And Bob's your uncle. You got it. Hey, that's looking pretty good. Are you ready for me to... Do the big reveal pullback. Andrea Scheer, how nice to see you. All right. Hmm. I mean, that's authentic looking, right? I mean, that that's, that's totally convincing. So you know what I need to do now, of course. That's right. Because this, now, now I'm committing a crime. You're seeing it here, live on YouTube. I signed it. As soon as you sign it, it is no longer d'après. It's authentic. There you go. What do you think? How's yours coming along? All right, I could keep fiddling with that, but Vermeer wouldn't. He was a master of restraint. So I'm going to stop. What do you think? Let me see. Let me look, let's go back here. Have a look at this. You buy it, right? She's a little thinner. She got a little portlier when he, uh, a bit more zoftic when he actually got around to painting her. But that's one of the interesting things that art historians will note. You know, it's interesting that he was obviously decided after drawing her that she should maybe put on a couple pounds. So that's what, that's, that's what he added. But there's no question that this is authentic. So yeah. All right, so let's get ready to uh, let's get ready to flood the market with these things. Let's get them out there. So here's I have a couple of thoughts for you. One is, of course, we are going to put these on the internet, and we are going to put hashtag SBS draw with me, so we can track them. I have a team of um, experts in the art market who are going to be following this entire. Uh, caper, and we're gonna f we're gonna start by saying 
it's amazing, but these un unknown Vermeer sketches are suddenly popping up on the internet all over the place. Just type in hashtag SBS draw with me and you'll see that they're popping up all over the world in private collections, right? That's what they are. They're always found in private collections. I found them in an attic. My great grandmother's suitcase, I opened them up. Yeah, she went to, uh, <clears throat> she went to Holland on vacation, probably picked it up then. Yeah, it was a sketchbook and uh, she didn't, you know, we just, we didn't really understand the value of it. So we've been using the sketchbook for just regular sketchbooking, but then we discovered that there was a Vermeer original in it. So yeah, we're, uh, we're glad about that. Okay. Yes. So that's what we want you to do. So make sure you do that. Now, here's another thing that I was thinking about. I love this sketchbook, but I'm in the enviable position of getting a replacement from it for a replacement cappuccino book from my friend Joe at Honolulu. I just had to call him up and go, Joe, I'm done with this one. Give me a new one. So what I'm thinking is, I want to give you this. I want to give you this, this particular cappuccino book. I'm going to give it to you with, oh my God, there's a Vermeer original in it. Yeah, you can have that. So I'll send it to you. Oh, I'll send it to one of you. I'm going to send it to one of you. But but you have to tell me that you want it. And the way you're going to do that is you are going to write to me. You're going to write to trollwithme at sketchbookschool.com. And you're going to say, very interested in that book. And I'm going to do, I'm going to randomly pick somebody to send it to. And I'm going to announce your name next time to say this is the person who got it. But I'm, I will say this, while it will be random, you know, if your email is interesting, it will be slightly less random. It will be random, but interesting emails, provocative emails, inspiring, entertaining emails will be nudged to the top of the bowl. All right. So there we have it. A complimentary Hanamula cappuccino book, 80 pages, 120 grams, 55 pounds. It's a good 55 pounds undefeated. Yeah, it's good. Oh, look, it comes with like a little coffee stain at the back. Is that like a cappuccino stain? It's kind of clever. Anyway. All right. So what else? Um, just a final couple of thoughts. Those of you who are in Spark Breakthrough, we're going to get together right after this and have the after party. We're going to continue working on these. We're going to make them even, I mean, maybe I'll spray some coffee on mine to age it. I'll put some dust on it. We'll continue working on our forgeries. Definitely going to keep doing that. Um, if you find this at all interesting, the, the blather that issues out of me every week on Thursdays, sign up for my emails. I say that not because I'm trying to sell you anything, because they're free. They're free and they take an enormous amount of effort. As you can see, everything I do, I do extremely well and I work extremely hard at it. But um, every Friday I send out an email essay. It's not a marketing thing, it's just a thing. I, I have logoria. I can't stop talking and writing. And if I write all this stuff, I need to, I need to expose it to the world. I'm too lazy to write another book. So I write these essays and I send them out every Friday. So they're out of my system and I can sleep reasonably well at night. So tomorrow I'm going to send one out. If you sign up for this, you'll get one. If you, I mean, just go to this thing, tell me where to send it. I'm not a mind reader people. So do that. What else? Um, yes. I want you to subscribe to this channel for several reasons. One, it feeds my ego to know that you're, you've subscribed to it, that you care enough to subscribe. But also, there's a little bell there, and if you click that bell, ching, then next time this happens, and it'll happen next Thursday at noon Eastern, so it's not going to be surprising, but you'll get a notification that, hey, that the forger is back at it. So you can join me again next week. So just subscribe. I, I ask a little. 
that's one of the things I ask you to do. Um, I think that's it. Is it? Yeah, that'll do. Oh, I know. There's one other thing that I could tell you about, just because, you know, why not? And that is that I will, that I, that in addition to emailing, doing videos, and doing my podcast, Art Before, Art for, what is it called? Art for All. Um, in addition to doing that, I also send out texts to some people. Yes. Whoops. That's not what I meant to do. Here I am back. Um, I also send out texts, and those texts are available here. What does that mean? He sends out what? So here's what how it works. If you're in the United States of America or the United States of Canada, is that what it's called? Whatever. Canada. Text me. Just type that number into your texting thing. And then what happens is I will text you stuff. I'll text you amazing artwork that I make, forgeries like this that I discover, thoughts that I have in the middle of the night, but I won't text you in the middle of the night, I promise. I, I won't ever do that. Um, but I'm going to assume that you're going to get up early and start making art. So I'll probably do it. I might do it first thing in the morning. And then I'll also send you, uh, you know, notifications if you want. Hey, draw with me there. I also will, um, send you the occasional joke and that's about it. And if you want to text me back, you can, it's like a two way thing. You text me, I will probably text you back unless you're saying something vulgar or dull. Um, and that's it. That's kind of the relationship between you and me and our various phones. I think I've given you enough to do today, right? I've, t I've, I've wrangled you into committing an international crime with me. I've forced you to sign up for a really amazing workshop with another person who's related to Holland. That somehow seems to be a light motif today. What else? I've told you to write to me if you want this cappuccino book. Um, I have inveigled you into my weekly essay stream by Dan going asking you to sign up to dannysessays.com. And I've told you to share your work online with SBS Draw With Me. That's it. It's not a lot to ask. You have nothing better to do. I know. I don't. But I've had fun and I've, you know, I see my wife is making snarky comments about the amount of coffee that I've had. She made this coffee and I've had maybe a half a cup of it. So it's not really that at all. It's just that I'm happy. I'm happy. It's spring. I'm with you. I'm making art. It's all good. So anyway, I'm glad that you've joined me. Allie Gregory, what have you been doing? What have you had to do that was more important than this? I'll see you guys um, next week, and I'll see you in Spark, and I'll see you on various other, I don't know. I'm breaking the internet with all these demands I'm putting on it. So I'll see you guys and your forgeries real soon. Thanks for drawing with me. <laughs>